everyone and welcome again to Gettysburg National Military Park. I'm Thompson Dasher. I'm a fellow with the Civil War Institute at Gettysburg College. Today I'm just south of the Peach Orchard on the second day's battlefield. I'm standing directly in the path of General Joseph Kershaw's South Carolina Brigade as it advanced towards Union lines on the afternoon of July 2nd, 1863. This assault on the Peach Orchard and the Stony Hill is one of the most fascinating actions of the battle, despite being eclipsed by later combat on the slopes of Little Round Top. It's also an excellent case study in looking at how the lay of the land can, contrib can contribute to the already chaotic nature of Civil War combat. That's what we'll be talking about today in the latest of a series of videos for the Civil War Institute at Gettysburg College. So to provide a bit of backstory to the actions that occurred here, we're going to look at General James Longstreet's plan for the second day's action. Throughout the day on July 2nd, Longstreet was tasked with locating and outflanking the left end of the Union line. His intelligence suggested that the two rocky hills to the south were unoccupied, and he should order his first corps to advance in their direction and hopefully take them. By the late afternoon, he had two divisions at his disposal to carry out his plan. He ordered John Bell Hood's division southward to swing around the extreme left of Union lines. Simultaneously, Lafayette McClaw's division advanced forward to attack federal forces occupying a low ridge across the Emmitsburg Road. The advance was designed for each Confederate brigade to step off in succession from right to left. Kershaw's brigade was formed in Besecker Woods on the right of McClaw's division, supported by Paul Semmes Georgians to their rear, William Barksdale's Mississippians to his left, and William Wofford's Georgians to his left rear. Kershaw understood his objective, and many of the men under his command had faith in their general's abilities. A sergeant of the second South Carolina wrote, there was not a man who would not follow him to the death. Unfortunately, the terrain that awaited Kershaw's men gave many of them just that opportunity. Now, as the leftmost brigade of Hood's division stepped off, Kershaw knew it was soon time for him to do the same. As the South Carolinians started off towards the Emmitsburg Road, Kershaw found himself in a rather precarious situation. To his left, Union artillery, supported by infantry, had formed a line facing southward on the high elevation of the Peach Orchard. To his front was Colonel William Tilton's brigade, occupying the wooded Stony Hill. He realized that if he tried to redirect his attack in either direction, he would receive flanking fire from either the Peach Orchard or the Stony Hill and the Rose Woods. Additionally, Kershaw noted in his official battle report that there was a morass or marshy ground located just beyond the Rose Farm. That would prove difficult if he tried to direct his attack further southward. He was left with no choice but to proceed towards this kink in the federal line and plan accordingly. Kershaw wrote in this report following the battle that the landscape posed a great challenge to his movements, stating, the numerous fences in the way, the stone building and barn and the morass and a raking fire of grape and canister rendered it difficult to retain the line in good order. But notwithstanding these obstacles, I brought my center to the point intended. Kershaw has split his brigade, ordering his three rightmost regiments, the 7th, 3rd, and 15th South Carolina, to continue towards the Stony Hill near the Rose Farm. Meanwhile, he would order his leftmost regiments, the 2nd, 8th, and 3rd South Carolina Battalion to turn to the north to assault the Union batteries in the Peach Orchard. At first glance, this may not seem like that dramatic of a change in elevation, but taking a closer look reveals just how chaotic and difficult it must have been to traverse this sloping ground in the face of artillery fire. One soldier in the 2nd South Carolina wrote that it was the most terrible fire to which they were ever exposed. Surely, this would have only been amplified by the unfavorable ground. The splitting of Kershaw's brigade also led to a breakdown in communications. 
the second South Carolina ended up veering to the right in their advance towards the Peach Orchard, exposing their left flank even further to enemy fire. The Colonel of the second, John Doby Kennedy, recalled, I saw half a dozen at a time, knocked up and flung to the ground like trifles. There were familiar forms and faces with parts of their heads shot away, legs shattered, arms torn off, etc. The second could not keep up this assault, and the survivors were forced to withdraw and seek refuge in a depression. Meanwhile, to their left, the 3rd and 8th South Carolina were surprised to see a blue wave moving swiftly down towards them. The 2nd New Hampshire had used the withdrawal of the 2nd North South Carolina to their advantage and launched a counterattack that sent the two remaining Confederate regiments into a retreat. This retreat left the Peach Orchard relatively quiet until the arrival of Barksdale's brigade further north, which had not followed Kershaw closely enough to effectively support him. His right flank, however, continued to press on towards the right flank of Tilton's brigade. They encountered stiff resistance from the 118th Pennsylvania, who fired from the cover of the Rose Woods. Kershaw's remaining regiments on his right pressed the attack against the Stony Hill, against the 118th Pennsylvania. However, they were unable to fully take the position until the arrival of General George Anderson's Georgians, who came up from the south and supported this attack. And slowly but surely, Kershaw was able to move on to this low ridge here beyond the Peach Orchard and the Stony Hill. And they would occupy that and hold that during the later fight at the wheat field.